Hi to everyone. Um, I'm a believer in being punctual when people have made the effort to, to call in at four. So uh, I'd like to make a start. Now. And I, I'm, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Scylla Ross. I'm vice principal here at the Cooperative College. And it's an absolute pleasure uh, to welcome you to the webinar today. Um, I'm, I thought we'd begin by um, introduce, asking each of us to just briefly introduce ourselves and very quickly say why, that, why you're interested in participating in this seminar, in this webinar, sorry. And then I'll hand over to Joe, uh, who will be talking to us very broadly about cooperation in Mesopotamia project and working in, in Rojava in particular. So uh, if we can just begin by introducing ourselves, that would be great. And can I propose just as well etiquette in our uh, etiquette that when we're not speaking, we keep our little microphone muted because I think it just helps in terms of any interference. So um, hopefully you can all see each other across the top of the screen. And uh, I'll hand over perhaps to Teresa. I can see you there. Hello, my name's Theresa Easton. I'm based in Newcastle. I'm an artist. I'm interested in um, this particular seminar because I've just been reading about um, democratic confederalism and I just want to understand a little bit more about this quite unique place where people live and, and have sort of struggled to make happen. I just want to know more, really. Thank you very much. And Kat? Um, hello, I'm based here in Cardiff. Um, I'm, I work at the University of South Wales, that's my day job. Um, but um, I also volunteer for CARA, which is a, an NGO that works with displaced academics, um, people in exile. So um, I'm working on a, a number of projects with them at the minute. So I'm interested really to know what the cooperative is doing uh, in this particular set of um, activities. So I can perhaps bring that to bear as well. And I'm working with Syrians. That's great. Thank you very much, Kath and Martin. Okay, I'm Martin and I'm Chair of Cooperative Business Consultants and I've been involved in the co-op movement in the UK for many, many years and I've been following with great interest what's been happening in Rojava for the last two, three years. Thank you very much indeed. Well, once again, everyone, welcome. I am expecting that a couple of others will join us uh, during the webinar, but I have great pleasure in now passing over to Jo, who will uh, take us through her presentation. And the idea is... We've got a slide deck already, uh, which is going to talk to, which will take around about 30 minutes, and then the remaining 30 minutes will be used for conversation, discussion, many questions you might have, which I'm invited uh, to answer. Um, I'm, I'm be, just before I hand over to Joe, hello, Alan. Hello, hi. <laughs> hi. Hi, Alan. And just very briefly, because we're about to start, could I just ask you to kindly introduce yourself and why you've joined the webinar? Yeah. Ask to Joe. Uh, hi, everybody. So my name's Alan, obviously. Uh, I'm from, you know, getting to know the YPG volunteers who've gone over there, some of the YPJ volunteers, uh, trying to support them in whatever capacity possible. Uh, but also, you know, being from Africa, I'm quite passionate about the cause. And then I also work alongside a, a lad called John Lubbock, um, who works on a Wikipedia project for populating the Kurdish Wikipedia pages. That's great. Thanks very much indeed, Alan. Okay, Joe, you've uh, been introduced to everybody. Can we pass over to you? Yep. Okay, so uh, I'm going to try and share the slides again. How's that? Cool. Is that good? Okay, great. So, um, yeah, this is the first time I've ever done a webinar. So <laughs> let's see how it goes. <coughs> okay, so... Um, I'm speaking about this from the perspective of the Cooperation in Mesopotamia project, which is um, a project that's part of the Solidarity Economy Association. That's a cooperative that I'm a worker member of um, based in the UK. So I've been working on this project for about three years. Um, and at the beginning, it was basically like a research project, became like research and education project. As we tried to understand, okay, like what is the cooperative 
element of this revolution in northern Syria? And then how can we um, connect um, through the co-op movement to what's happening there and, and support it, basically? So like learning, spreading the word about it. And then now we're coming on to a more sort of tangible, um, practical solidarity kind of aspect, which I'll talk about more at the end. Um, so to start with, and this is going to be like, usually I do this, um, this workshop in like an hour in person. So this is like a shortened version. We're going to skip through just a bit of history to just to get our bearings a bit. But I'm missing out obviously like massive chunks of really important history. It's just to give a bit of background. So why is it called cooperation in Mesopotamia? So Mesopotamia, as you might know, is a historical name for a region um, that you can see here. It means actually the land between the rivers. And so in this case, the rivers are the Euphrates and the Tigris rivers that stretch through modern day Turkey, Syria, Iraq. Um, and this is the, the site of the first kind of civilizations, basically. This is what we also call the Fertile Crescent, kind of roughly aligns with this. And um, since the first sort of city-states emerged in this region, um, in like prehistory, there have been many, many civilizations that have risen and fallen. So the last of these um, was the Ottoman Empire, which stretched right around the Mediterranean at its height. And then at its sort of lower peak was covering basically all of modern day Turkey and the whole of this Mesopotamian valley. <laughs> So partly um, the Kurdish freedom movement um, uses the name Mesopotamia a lot because it, it goes back to a time before city-states and before the land was divided by nation-states. Um, so the land was divided uh, from the Ottoman Empire by predominantly French and British diplomats at the end of the First World War. They basically just drew lines on maps and said like, okay, this can be part of France and this can be part of Britain and this can be part of Russia. So um, there were a series of different treaties and things like that that I won't go into, but what we've ended up with is the division of what you could call Kurdistan, um, which basically is like the land where Kurds live, like the majority Kurdish regions. Um, it's worth pointing out that these are very diverse regions and always have been, so it's not that only Kurdish people live there, but um, this is a kind of contiguous region where there's a lot of Kurdish people that have lived for a very long time. So um, since the division of the Ottoman Empire, the, the region that we call Kurdistan has been split into the four nation states of Turkey, Iraq, Syria and Iran. So today we're going to just really talk about Rojava, uh, which is the purple part here on the left. So Rojava means west because, as you can see, divided into four, um, these are often called like north, east, south and west Kurdistan by the Kurdish population. And Rojava just means west. Okay, so skipping right through lots of history. Um, of course, in Syria, the, the, the moment when Syria kind of became uh, on the minds of, of, of people around the world a lot more was at the start of the revolutionary uprisings in 2011, which quite quickly spiraled into a sort of proxy global war between lots of different states and non-states and a, a big complex mess that has obviously devastated the entire country and, and like a lot of the regions around it. it still continues today. <clears throat> in the midst of this, however, in the northern regions, in the Kurdish inhabited regions, that purple part of the map that we saw earlier, um, the Kurdish population of especially Kobani, which is a city on the Turkish border in the north of Syria, people took to the streets and they declared a revolution. So this was uh, obviously happening during a time when many people in Syria were taking to the streets and calling for a revolution. But in particular, um, these people who were part, it, this was related to the Kurdish freedom movement, a movement that's been going on for like 40 years already. They decided to say, okay, we choose neither the regime, the Syrian regime of Assad, nor the, the sort of other, what was left of the sort of revolutionary strains uh, 
which were becoming increasingly dominated by um, like radical Islamism, <clears throat> of course, not exclusively, but um, they said, okay, we choose a third way. And what we want is this idea of democratic confederalism. So a quick note about geography. So here, this is a, a very recent kind of who is in control of different parts of Syria map. Um, so the red, as you can see, the Assad regime has regained control of a large part of the, the country. Um, the, the region that's currently under the, the system to, to greater or lesser extents of this democratic confederal system as a result of the Rojava revolution um, sort of spreading out from, from its original uh, start in Kobani is yellow. So we can see already that it's not anymore just the Kurdish region, not anymore that purple kind of strip of land that we saw on the map before, but it's spread um, right through also like Arab and um, Christian, Syriac, Assyrian, um, like majority populated areas. So it's worth saying that um, as different um, cities and, and areas in this, what's now the yellow part, have been like freed from the Islamic State control. Um, new like civil councils have been set up of the residents who are interested in taking this system forward in their own locality. Um, so this is this is how it's spread. Um, and then the green part on the left is worth talking about as well at the top. So um, unfortunately, half of that green part at the top there on the left is uh, the region of Afrin. So that, that's part of Rojava, it's part of Western Kurdistan, very, very strong majority of Kurdish. Um, one year ago was invaded and occupied by the Turkish state and allied um, like proxy militias, basically. So this is still under occupation today. And um, the green there signifies the regions that are under the control of Turkey or like militias related to Turkey. So also in the key on the left here, it says black Islamic state. Islamic state in the last few weeks have been basically wiped out in terms of territory, but obviously there are still sleeper cells of them and many other kind of very similar ideologically based groups all around in all parts of this, uh, this map. So what is democratic confederalism? I like to use these um, diagrams that I found because <laughs> <coughs> I like thinking about structures in terms of diagrams. So it's a decentralized system. It's a system without a state. It's a bottom up grassroots system where the base is the local community assembly, what is called in Kurdish komin, which obviously has the same root as commune in English and French and other, word, other languages. So um, it's based basically yeah, on these neighborhood assemblies. Um, maybe everybody in my street gets together every two weeks in a meeting to discuss our problems and how we can solve our problems ourselves as a community. And then we have our delegates who we elect, a gender diverse pair who rotate periodically and we send those to the level of uh, our little part of the city and then so on and so forth up to the city level, the region level, etc. So that's basically how democratic confederalism works. It's based on a system of democratic autonomy, which is people making decisions for themselves and having common ownership of the resources in their community. And then it's worth also talking about this, the three pillars, kind of principles really, of um, gender liberation, ecology and direct democracy. So not representative democracy where we choose somebody who goes and makes decisions um, supposedly on our behalf, but we have an actual say um, and, and take part in making decisions and plans about our lives and the things that affect us. So just to talk about some of the changes, obviously there's a lot, <laughs> a lot, a lot, a lot since 2012. Um, and there's continuous changes all the time as the system develops and learns from its own mistakes and evolves. Um, so in education, um, always in the Assad regime, which was I think in control for 40 years of Syria, 
um, Arabic was the only language that people were allowed to be educated in. Now there is uh, the rule that everybody should be educated in their own mother tongue. So the three official languages of the region are Kurdish, Arabic and Syriac. Syriac and Kurdish were banned under the Assad regime. Uh, also, women's education and, and the education of girls is really very important. There are a lot of new like women's academies where people are also learning like the history of women, the history of the region, the history of the nation state itself, the history of patriarchy, as well as um, talking about the new system, what does democracy mean, what does education mean. Um, yeah, and the education system really is based on this, like discussing things and rather than having a kind of top down, you know, of course there's somebody, there is like a teacher, but it's not any more like this authoritarian, you learn all these things and you just recite them kind of system. Uh, and I've also written here genealogy. So genealogy is a, a social science that's been developed by the Kurdish women's movement. So the root is jin, which means woman in Kurdish, and ology obviously comes from the, is it Greek? Like logi, logos, knowledge. So they describe it as, as um, for science from a women's perspective. It might be fair to say it's kind of um, looking at the world through a lens that is not patriarchy. It's, it's not really a good way to say that in English, but it's really, um, looking at things in a very, very different way. So at the beginning, when I heard about it, I thought, okay, isn't that just like women's studies or something, but it's very, very different. There's a very different focus there. Um, so the justice system as well has, is changing a lot. There are still the old system, you know, this is not just a clean break with a completely new system, just uh, superimposed. There's the need to develop everything and, and like build education into everything again. So um, there's still, you know, the state prison system and court system and things like this, but mostly the people in the prisons are members of ISIS or people who've committed very serious crimes. The new approach is to, to try to solve issues in the community. So if there is uh, a complaint against somebody, then the first step is to, to speak to everybody involved try to get people together it's kind of like a community mediation system um, and there are these women's houses so this picture is a woman's house that i visited in 2016 and they were telling us yes it's a it's a house that's owned by all the women who live in the community but um, also it's a place where people can come with their problems and especially there are problems about like domestic violence forced marriage underage marriage all these things which actually they've made a law against um just before this actually 2015 um they they outlawed all these things but obviously these are deep-rooted traditions a lot of them so these things are still happening so it's how do we create um a better way to respond to them and how do we educate these men and also women and everyone in our community um to change the way that they think about such things and yeah, I've also written that only women deal with issues of female oppression. So there's a female like the equivalent of a police force, the Asaish, um, and, and they're the ones who would deal with, they don't only do that, but if there's an issue of uh, like rape or, or sexual assault or something like that, it would be only women that deal with that. And of course the economy. So this is the area that we're most active in. Um, the Overall aim, the kind of long-term goal, is to transition the region to 80% cooperative economy without forbidding private ownership and without taking land off people who, who own land who are, who are still there. So this is being done by a variety of different mechanisms. There are um, kind of economic sort of councils um, and structures, some of which we work with, that encourage the setting up of co-ops they lend money and they, they, you know, support people in setting them up. And um, they'll also give kind of, you know, if there is some resources, they'll give them for free to the cooperatives, but the privately owned businesses will have to pay a lot more money and things like this. So in this way, they're developing the economic system. 
So in May 2018, um, two members of my cooperative, me and somebody else, we went to um, what we think might be the first cooperative delegation from the UK to Rojava in order to develop our projects that we've been discussing with the women's economic structures in the region. We visited some cooperatives while we were there. So this is a really small, um, this is all of it that you can see here, um, women's cooperative bakery in a really small, well, like a hamlet, basically. Um, it's a really small village that's very, very far from any shops or towns. Um, and their problem that, well, I mean, they have many problems, but one of their problems was it's very hard for them to get bread. So now having this bakery in the village and it's in the hands of women, it's being run by women, women are sharing the profits and women are working there together and developing their skills together. Their community has bread and also the local villages, they also come there and get bread as well. So the word is spreading. So this is a, a thing that it might sound surprising, but women were not considered capable of baking bread in a bakery before. So these are like really, really new kind of radical ideas. These were a couple of Hevgritten um, Ajin, which basically just means women's cooperative shops. Um, these are also in, oh, these were in a, a big city, but like a very deprived kind of outskirts neighborhood. Um, we were also really pleased to see in the picture on the top left, um, they're selling these bottles of water, which are bottled by a water bottling cooperative called Rojav. Rojava, which means like sun water, but also Rojava, which is the name of the region. <coughs> and democratizing energy is really, really important. So uh, obviously national grid has been really affected by the ongoing war. <coughs> and a lot of regions are without electricity a lot of the time. Some areas are just without electricity. And in the big cities, you'll have electricity during the day, but there'll be several power cuts like all day. So this one is um, again in the hands of women, as they say, and it's being run and you know, owned collectively by that community. We went to two different like agricultural kind of growing places, um, which are not cooperatives, but they're wanting to to run them cooperatively as part of a, a community which will live there. So it will be mostly people like actually orphans as well um, and people who especially like women who've been widowed and things like this. So they'll have collectively run um, agricultural systems for livelihoods and um, kind of democratically owned communal resources. Uh, this is a women-run market in Derrick. This is the first ever women-run market in Derrick. <laughs> it's quite newly set up when we visited uh, almost a year ago. So yeah, it's also not a cooperative. There's plans, hopes for it to become a cooperative, which is again, all part of the education. Um, every single market store in this building has a woman selling things there. So again, it's like very surprising for people when they come in and they see that there's all these women there working because these are quite new ideas. <coughs> Sorry about my cough. <laughs> I didn't have a voice at all yesterday, so we're quite lucky. Um, so finally, two um, projects which also internationalists are, uh, are playing a bit of a role in. One is the Jeune Noir Women's Village. This is also, as well as being a village for women um, and their children, it's also being run on and built on ecological principles. So they're using this old style of building, traditional style of building. You can see the bricks at the bottom left there. They're called Kerpich, which is like, kind of like adobe made of mud and straw. Um, and it's a, a traditional building method which has somehow was starting to get lost again because the regime would just build things with concrete. Um, and they've also got a, a school now that started running and um, again, a bakery that's like a collective livelihood for the people that live there. And there's Kurdish women, Arabic women, and um, international, like some international people from Europe as well, who are helping to build things and set everything up. And the internationalist commune. So these are people that we're in touch with quite a lot. Um, they are um, 
a commune with like they have an academy as well for internationalists who've gone to Rojava to learn about the revolution and to bring some skills um, so especially at the moment it's like growing skills grey water systems um, they're trying to build a wind turbine this tower on the bottom right is the the tower they've procured from the municipality to try and make a wind turbine um, so these are all things that we also want to help with. We've been helping already and the co-op movement here has already been a bit supportive on that. <coughs> um, their main project is called Make Rajava Green Again. So there's a book actually, which is a really great book. You can read the PDF online or you can buy it for six pounds. Um, this money is going towards um, buying seeds and experimenting with these different ecological methods which can then, you know, the, the really successful ones be spread out across the region in different ways. So it's kind of a pilot project testing area where international people can come and like teach each other and share skills and, and then teach the ones that work really well to the local community. So talking a bit about the UK, um, support for Rojava has been really growing over the last few years um, and also from the co-op movement. So we've been doing a lot of different events and workshops and things like that. And also some co-ops have been involved in um, various different projects. So this was a crowdfunding project like nearly three years ago um, where they raised 10,000 pounds, a women's bakery cooperative in Kobani in that first city where the revolution was declared, which was then later decimated completely by um, the conflict by the Islamic State actually who had it under siege for several months. Um, there have been, this here is a picture of the first ever cooperative conference in Rojava in northern Syria. Um, so we organised a letter of solidarity, like 35 different co-ops here in the UK signed it. Um, we've also sent letters of support, like when the invasion of Afrin happened um, and got co-ops to sign it. So it's a way of communicating and having some, some connection between these different movements. More recently, we've seen um, new steps being taken. So we managed to organize a co-op block on a demonstration. We think it's the first co-op block on any political demonstration in quite a long time. Um, it really shows that members of co-ops here, especially like worker co-ops um, and people involved in, well, yeah, different kinds of co-ops to be honest. Um, they're, really, they're really very interested and they really care about this. Um, we had our first UK genealogy camp, this uh, social science I was talking about before. So they've been happening around Europe. Um, there hadn't been one in the UK yet and co-ops supported having this first UK genealogy camp. So just to talk a bit about, so we've got some more context for where the system is being developed. Obviously there's a war ongoing. The bottom left picture is um, Afrin region being bombarded by Turkey um, in January last year before it was even occupied. The top left is um, showing these monoculture, like very pesticide, chemical pesticide and fertilizer heavy wheat crops, which the Assad regime planted just year after year after year for like 40 years. So this land, which was the fertile crescent, is actually not that fertile anymore. And also the local communities have lost a lot of the skills in growing, which they would traditionally have had. The top right is about the oil. Um, so obviously the economy is very oil reliant. Um, there's not really a way of exporting and importing things from the region. And so um, also people are using oil, like really unrefined or kind of DIY refined oil for everything from baking bread to heating your house to your car. Um, so there's a lot of pollution, which is the bottom right picture. So these are the two main projects. We're working on several projects, but these are the two main ones that we're going forward with at the moment. One is to have a cooperative twinning project. So we've got three UK co-ops that are committed to going forward in the kind of trial project um, of being twinned, having a sister cooperative in Rojava that they will communicate with and, and kind of the idea is to set up mutual learning and, and better understanding of our different contexts. And the renewable energy cooperative um, and also help so part of that is helping the internationalist commune with the wind turbine 
and part of it is also working with the women's economic structures to have a community owned um, renewable energy project so like those generators but renewable energy so here's a couple of questions for you you probably will have other questions as well um, what ways can you think of uh, apart from the ones that we've mentioned for UK co-ops and others to support Rojava but especially co-ops I guess but maybe you're not all in co-ops and what can we in the UK learn from the Rojava revolution How was it for time? Jo, hello. Hello. <laughs> Hi, thank you so much. <coughs> that was absolutely perfect. Uh, I just sent you something through chat to say um, two minutes. <laughs> so, <laughs> thank you so much for a really fantastic introduction. Um, have people noted the questions? Because what I'd like to propose, Jo, is that you, you uh, once people have noted them, then we can, you can get rid of the slide deck. I also just wanted to check with everybody that we have recorded uh, Joe's um, presentation and Joe and others, are you happy for that to have been the case? If not, we can stop it and are quite happy to do so. Are people comfortable with that? Yes. Thank mm -hmm. you very much indeed. Thank you. Uh, Joe, right, so we're, we're back. Um, we've got everybody across the top. Um, and people might like to um, have a go at answering or responding to those two questions uh, from Joe. So anybody like to make a start? Or you might, if not those, or we'll have a go at those first, and we can, you might have some other questions of your own. I guess my first thought was, um, you don't really hear a lot about this in the media. It's not kind of discussed in this kind of way. You tend to hear about... Rojava is, is a kind of another war-torn place in Syria that gets sort of swallowed in, in the whole kind of Middle East upheaval. Um, so getting that information out, the way it's been explained in quite a succinct way, is one way that could, you know, we could help um, the region, whether it's through just passing on that information by word of mouth or having um, some kind of literature. I mean, I'm going to check out the website. That's the first thing I'll be doing and looking at it and sharing it. Um, so that was that. Yeah, that was my first thought, really. That's great. Trees. Any, anybody else got any comments or views in terms of what are the type of support? Uh, the co-op movement might offer, or those who are supportive of the co-op movement could offer towards, towards this project. Hey, um, so I know you mentioned, well, firstly, thank you for the presentation. That was actually really interesting. And it's nice to be able to learn from somebody who's not Kurdish about my uh, home country. So that's fantastic. Thank you very much for today. <laughs> um, I think something that I want to maybe mention that I've already mentioned when I first came onto the call was obviously we do the Wikipedia work and John Lubbock, the, the, the chap who kind of heads it all, he mentioned a really interesting fact and that is that companies like Microsoft and Google will now look at the amount of, um, the amount of entries in Wikipedia coming out of a particular country or area before they decide to invest IT equipment. So in terms of preparatory work, if we can, if there is, you know, a group of people maybe within the cooperatives or maybe in the future who might be interested in helping us uh, just, you know, churn out literally really basic entries into Wikipedia, uh, just so we have that sort of um, that data available for these companies that may at some point in the future decide to invest once the companies, uh, the country stabilizes a bit more, the region stabilizes a bit more. Uh, so that's the sort of preparatory work side of things like, you know, the groundwork we could do towards that. And I think, you know, something that's also worth mentioning is that these events, so these Wikipedia workshops, we have in a, in a place called New Speak House, which is just opposite Brick Lane uh, in East London. Uh, I'm sure some of you have heard of New Speak House before. They run all sorts of socio-political tech uh, events. Uh, they're quite active on Facebook, actually. Um, it would be great to maybe have a chat, maybe before we attend one of these events, if people are interested in attending. Uh, and then maybe go to one of these events where people can be taught how to do uh, these Wikipedia entries that people don't know how to do, for example. Uh, and it's also a good opportunity for people to get together, get to know other people, not just within who are passionate about Rajava, for example, um, but also other people who are interested in socio-political tech and 
quite progressive thinking, perhaps, maybe. So that's that's really what I want to say about the Wikipedia side of things. Um, yeah. Thank you. Is is that helpful, Joe? Is that something you you think would be useful to explore? <coughs> Sorry, I should cough before I unmute the microphone. <laughs> Um, yeah, I was. I'm aware of the Wikipedia project. I haven't met. Uh, is it John? I haven't yeah. met him personally, but um, I've seen many of his messages, like encouraging people to go. And yeah. I don't live in London, but I, I totally would otherwise. Um, yeah, it's tricky, isn't it? I mean, we could have a long conversation about uh, the dangers of investment, but also, I mean, the mm. current situation is um, that there's the economic embargo, which is put in place really by. Um, the Kurdish regional government of Iraq, um, who are like kind of at least militarily, if not anything else, aligned with Turkey. So there's a very big difficulty in taking even basic tech into the region, um, which we're coming up against strongly in our renewable energy project. Mm. So um, thinking about that also would be really useful when we're thinking about technology, is uh, how to move this blockade. Joe, could I ask a question as well, please? I mean, um, speaking from a sort of cooperative education point of view, I was absolutely fascinated to hear about the sort of women's, um, well, the sort of the, the genealogy is, is, I think, is the way to pronounce it. It's absolutely fascinating using that different type of lens. But I'm just wondering, from a co-op ed point of view, what are you doing there and what sort of education is going on? It uh, sounded like it would be actually quite practical and technical in the true sense of the word is there anything else that we can help support on that um you know across the movement as in in terms of you know any sort of you know co-working together on that and peer-to-peer -peer support or you know what, what what would be useful there joe yeah i imagine there'll be another genealogy camp in the uk so it would be interesting to get like people from co-ops to come to that um it's also like this one that we had there was uh women from the kurdish women's movement who were like giving educational uh presentations on the history of kurdistan the history of um the kurdish movement um but we also had everyone who was there well not everybody but a lot of people also gave presentations about other social movements that they've been involved in different kinds of activism from trade unions to like um freedom of movement struggles to like um like environmental um movements and things like that so if we can bring cooperative education into that would be really great and also um for example in the kurdish community center in london there's been a kind of will to set up the the restaurant that's there as a cooperative um, but there isn't really a lot of understanding on how to do that so this is also a kind of back burner kind of idea that we already discussed with uh a couple of people there they were very interested so i think that yeah um, those just off my off the top of my head but i'm sure there are many other things too uh, thank, th thanks very much indeed any other questions any other comments or observations from participants um, yeah if i may um i'd just like to add that i worked well i have worked closely with the kurdish community center in north london um, and I've been approached about possibly uh, maybe co-leaving the youth movement. So if I can do something to help support that, if you can think of ways that, you know, where I can help maybe get that message across or set it up. Uh, I know you said that they're not really sure how to run the cooperative or well, run it as a cooperative, the restaurant that is. Uh, I'd probably agree with that. Um, I think there are a lot of people there. There's a lot of man and woman power, I should say, so people power. Um, but actually, yeah, there's, there's still the language barrier. Uh, there is still this... Um, there is an education barrier as well. I think you're right. And I, I think, you know, if I was to approach them, if we were to approach them, sorry, and say, look, you know, I know you're trying to do this. I know you're trying to set this up. Uh, why don't we have some workshops around it and identify the needs and then maybe get them on board? Because at the moment, one of the issues I have, you know, being a curd myself is that, you know, the Wikipedia is, uh, again, and I hate to keep bringing it up, it's a classic example is that there's a lot of talk about doing things, but actually getting people down to commit and that sort of thing, that seems to come from the outside towards the inside. You know, the, the in... The inward facing groups perhaps uh, they are much more focused with this or the um the war and the uh, the uh, the um yeah the, the war side of things rather than the actual cooperative side of things it's a relatively new concept i think this whole make rajava green thing again 
And so I think there's going to be, and I'm sure I'm probably repeating things you already know, uh, but I just like to really sort of emphasize that I'd like to help wherever possible. If you can think of any ways where I can help maybe set up, even if there's a few people to start with, who can help with setting little mini cooperative projects up and then hopefully getting a movement built on that and where we can begin to incorporate other smaller projects and maybe get a bigger sort of platform going that people then sort of feel part of rather than something they may have taken part in at one point. Does that make sense? Okay. <laughs> He's coughed. <laughs> I, I was just going to say that there are actually quite a lot of resources that could be spread more widely. Uh, I mean, there's a Facebook. Uh, Joe's always posting stuff on, on Facebook, mm. on the page there, which people can share. There's also some, some really great videos on, on YouTube, uh, again, that perhaps aren't spread or shared as widely as, as they could be. Um, so I, th I think there's that whole aspect of, of spreading that through the UK co-op movement and thinking about UK co-op events and how, I mean, I know Joe's done uh, sessions at the last couple of co-op ways forward conferences in Manchester and I imagine he's probably doing one again this year, but just getting getting out all those all those resources and the, and the website, Cooperation in Mesopotamia, it's just, you know, a store box of every information you could want about how, how co-ops are being developed in Rojava. And the other thing I was just going to say is, which I think comes on to the second question that you had posted, co-ops in Rojava are not the same as co-ops in the UK, but that's probably a good thing because we can learn a lot about, for instance, around gender, around ecology and so on, that isn't so prevalent in the UK co-op movement, but it's you know, some fantastic advances are being made uh, in Rojava, so there's a lot to learn there about the differences, and the differences can be positive as well as, you know, they're not doing things in the 19th century way that we're used to doing things, they're actually doing it in a much more open, community-based based way that, that really has a lot to, to make us think about how we do things. Yeah, thanks for mentioning that, Martin, and picking up on the second question, which in many ways is like more important. <laughs> um, also because it doesn't really get addressed as much as I, as I like, I would like to. Um, yeah, also um, in, when we were meeting with the Women's Economy Committee in Rojava, they, they talked many times about, you know, um, the difference in setting up cooperatives inside a capitalist system and setting up cooperatives outside a capitalist system. And I think this would be really worth us kind of reflecting on and thinking deeply about actually the ways forward um event this year we're doing something with also cooperation jackson who are like a contemporary u.s like black liberationist um cooperative movement and so it's going to be really interesting i think to hear about to what extent um how far can cooperatives um you know reform the system um Thanks. Has anybody got any other comments? I mean, I'd like to just say one thing. I, I was particularly interested in the co-op block, and I'm so, really sorry I wasn't able to get to that. But I think it's something about the difference between uh, co-ops in the UK and co-ops elsewhere. But I, I, I'm quite a relative newcomer to the co-op movement. I've been very much involved in other social movements all of my life. But um, the idea of that sort of engaging in a in a much more upfront and dare I say political small p way is is something that sort of you know I feel is 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 overdue in terms of this is just my view of course in terms of sort of cooperative activism. So whenever I think about co-ops or why I've come into this post, for example, I have to say I always see myself as an organizer <laughs> in the same way that I've been a trade union organizer all my life. And it's just I just think it's quite interesting and very valuable and important to be, you know, quite bold, recognising the sort of, you know, you're, you're balancing lots of different, different views and perspectives and so on, but being quite bold about being out there and, and, and you know, addressing this in a, in, a, in a way that's probably quite new for a lot of UK co-ops. So I just wanted to say how much I sort of welcome that, really. And um, it seems to me that, you know, the, 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 this might be something that the co-op, movement or certainly those those who organize within it uh, will feel much more confident about doing in the future 
could, could I just add something, if I might, please, is that I thought it was really interesting. And thank you, Joe. Um, I, I mean, obviously, I suppose from my perspective, where perhaps uh, my professional uh, interest, although I've got other activist interests as well, is around education, is that I'm wondering the extent to which um, cooperative education, both for children and adults, is able to support what I think is obviously a, a fundamental building block for the longevity of an alternative way of living. So um, I don't know what currently has been uh, given or support is offered to, to, to what I think are obviously the very important long-term uh, building blocks to support the other work that is, is obviously happening in terms of the economy. I don't know, Joe, if you, you're able to talk a little bit to, to that, please. I'm not sure if I totally understood the question. Do you mean in Rojava? Yes, yes. Like so, what, what kind of education? Yeah, so obviously we've, uh, you know, the, we've got the growth in the UK of the co-op schools and the co-op colleges obviously uh, supports other things as well. But it seems that, you know, the, the, the economic work and the long-term economic work can be supported by and should be and is supported by the work that's done with schools etc so where are we in the uk supporting that or is is are we not at the moment yeah i think here is where we get into some kind of difficult territory because the the systems that are being set up in rojava are like much more radical than our systems here Yes. So immediately what you come up against is like, oh, actually, we're coming from quite a liberal paradigm. Yes. And then when if we're doing then education, there's quite a lot of different barriers. There's um, stuff to do with like language and culture, which is not insurmountable. But then um, I think it's a bit tricky. I think it, it needs like a deep analysis and discussion on like what exactly would they like people in Rojava like to learn from the co-op movement here and how can we make sure that we're not trying to kind of teach some kind of neoliberal values which have sort of seeped into our consciousness through uh, our yeah, you know, social yeah. conditioning and stuff like this um, but yeah we are involved in um, sort of the practical work which is especially like the renewable energy side of things um, and this twinning project is kind of the idea of that is to have a basis of more understanding, um, which is already about deepening the communication and, and then therefore also understanding like what is needed and what is useful. So it's like a long term, like building up um, a deeper understanding and then finding ways of bringing in knowledge at the same time. Okay. But, but also like learning from an actual revolution that is actually creating a whole new system and way of life which we're desperately in need of, to be honest. <laughs> no, absolutely. So I, I, I saw it much more as, as a, um, an exchange of ideas, thinking that it's not just a one-way system, yeah. but actually that we could learn from that too. But that there would be people within the UK educational system who would have knowledge and skills to bring to what they want to achieve, I guess. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, thank you. And I would say, Joe, you have clearly not been looking at the new cooperative university prospectus. <laughs> <laughs> it's actually about changing the world. <laughs> but I, I digress. Um, any other comments or points? Um, are there going to be any more events? I'd like to come along to more of these, um, find out more about what you do, uh, your plans, um, come along to the college maybe. Because um, I'm really looking to get my teeth into something like this and um, trying to run a maybe parallel project to what the Kurdish community may be already doing. Yeah, so there's a workshop um, that I'm doing in Newcastle on the 31st in the cooperative cinema that's there. Okay. It'll be a film and a like interactive workshop. Um, and then we've got Ways Forward, I think, is after that, yeah, on the 5th in Manchester, this uh, panel with Corporation Jackson on cooperatives as a tool of liberation. Um, and then I think the next one will be the Worker Co-op Weekend. 
Cool. And then in, in the summer, there'll be some events as well. Can I just ask, Joe, is anything similar happening in the cooperative movement in the rest of Europe that you're aware of? You mean supporting Rojava? Yes, and trying to create this kind of solidarity. Yeah, um, there is like not the same kind of thing, but there is um, definitely from Italy, um, I imagine from Greece, I'm not sure about the cooperative movement precisely. Um, and also from Germany, there's a lot of projects. I'm not sure exactly how much of these are like cooperative movements specifically, but there's definitely a lot of solid projects um, related to these regions. And like in Italy, they have a like municipality twinning project with Rojava as well. So they even had like meetings of municipal like I don't know, representatives from regions in Italy and in Rojava and they met up in Iraqi Kurdistan. Thank you. Any other observations or comments? Or any anything you'd like to? Uh, yeah, are you running anything in London, or is there an office or representative representative in London that I can maybe meet with to find out more as well? In the meantime, um, no, my co-op's based in Oxford, and cool. I am based in Brighton, but I do come to London a lot, so we can we can swap contacts afterwards. Um, cool. I'm actually going to be in Oxford on Friday, so maybe I could pop in. <laughs> <laughs> I won't be there, but you can you can probably pop in. Yeah, cool. we can swap we can swap contacts later. Okay. Right. Okay. Any other comments? And if not, I might um, might close the webinar. Um, are there any closing comments you want to make, Joe? Anything else you'd like us to think about? Actually, yeah, I think it would be really important um, to talk about the hunger strikes that are going on. Um, so there's currently, it's difficult to know, but I think at least 5,000 Kurdish people on hunger strike, like all around the world. Um, three people in London who um, probably you also know, Alan, have just joined. Yeah. Um, and the, the first person who started this kind of current wave of hunger strikes is a woman called Leila Guzen. Mm -hmm. So she's an elected MP of the like pro Kurdish, pro women, pro LGBT party in um, in Turkey, who was imprisoned for tweeting criticism of the Turkish invasion of Afrin. She'd also been in prison before for like similar like terrorism charges because this is considered terrorism in Turkey. Um, so she she began her hunger strike back in November. Um, now it's i've lost count but like day 100 and maybe nearly 130 today yeah. um of her hunger strike so um her demand is not for herself but it's to break the isolation of the kurdish leader and political prisoner abdullah Öcalan, um who was engaged in a peace negotiation with the turkish state for several years which led to um really a path toward peace, which was broken by the, by the Turkish state in 2015, um, when the current kind of wave of um, very big violence and, and massacres and political oppression began in Turkey. So all of those elected representatives now who won like 13% in the elections in 2000 and, was that 2015? Yep. Um, they're almost all in prison now. Mm -hmm. um, and so all of the, the, the gains where they like won the municipalities, developed all of these new systems also in Turkey that we can see in Rojava, they were also developed in Turkey mm. alongside the state. So these gains have been uh, really destroyed. And now this is like, you know, the strategy, I think, really of the movement now, which was started by Leila Guven, is to break the isolation of Öcalan to reestablish the peace negotiation. And really, it's like even in, under Turkish law, he should be allowed to see his lawyer that he's not seen for eight years. You know, so it's not like really an unreasonable demand to yeah. let a, a political prisoner see his lawyer. 
So now, yeah, there's just waves and waves of people are joining this hunger strike. We have a, a guy in Wales, Imam Shish, who's on day 100 and, oh no, maybe day 90 something now. So it's, yeah, it's going to be just increasingly, increasingly serious. And it would be really great if everyone could like write to their MPs um, to try to get, you know, some movement on this. There's quite a lot of information. Um, maybe I can send something out, especially about Leila Given and Imam Shish. No. And if anyone's in Wales, I know one of you is in Wales. Yeah, there's a really important um, thing happening tomorrow in Wales where they really want MPs to be lobbied. Yes, they've got a, a debate in the Senate tomorrow. Cool. Yeah. Yeah. Great. Uh, thank, thanks, Joe. That's great. Uh, well, we'll we'll uh, we'll obviously oh, I can't speak on behalf of the cooperative movement, but um, that was a really uh, informative and important um, piece of work for me. So thank you, and it really is incumbent on the UK movement to do what it can, isn't it, and to to, to be as supportive and as, as it possibly can be. So thank you very much, Joe, and and thank you so much, everyone else, for participating in 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 the webinar.